educational video and the fair use doctrine. We want to clarify that this video is intended solely for educational purposes. The content is a transformative work that incorporates copyrighted material while strictly adhering to the fair use doctrine. The objective is to provide a narrative that encourages critical thinking and motivates viewers to form their own opinions. All copyrighted material belongs to its respective owners and there is no intention of violating any copyright laws. Additionally, this video is protected under the Fair Use Doctrine. Wise Society is a virtual platform that aims to instill wisdom and knowledge into education. It is powered by Bold Enterprises, LLC, and can be found on YouTube under the handle The Bold Authority. In medieval Europe, the Catholic Church held a level of power and influence over the population that is almost inconceivable today. This power came from a combination of factors, including persuasion, corruption, and coercion, but most of all, straight-up fear-mongering. Yes, the medieval church was heavily invested in the business of scaring the faithful into staying faithful. Today, we're going to take a look at how the medieval Catholic Church frightened its parishioners into obedience. Okay, let's see some self-punishment for having done wrong. We're going medieval on you. These days, when people hear the term Hellmouth, they're most likely to think of the television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if they think of anything at all. Indeed, modern visitors to medieval churches and cathedrals would probably regard the frightening sculpted images appearing over the entryway as mere art or ornamentation. But for the populace of the medieval era, who were superstitious and uneducated, the image of the Hellmouth was nothing short of terrifying. The Hellmouth was typically depicted as a ferocious beast devouring sinners during the Last Judgment. It was the first thing that parishioners would see on their way into the sanctuary, and the message was crystal clear. Obey the church, or this will happen to you. Wow, they were very, very subtle. Purgatory, in the Catholic religion, is an intermediate state that comes after death where people can expiate their sins before moving on to heaven. In medieval times, churchgoers were extremely concerned about how much time they might have to spend there. Luckily, there were several ways a person could ensure their wait wouldn't be overly long. For example, they could donate money and goods to the church, attend services regularly, or even purchase a certificate that could get them an early release. But for those who absolutely, positively had to be sure they would skip purgatory entirely, there was only one surefire way, donate one of their children to the church. In ancient times, religions may have demanded human sacrifice to appease their gods, but the medieval church had a more pragmatic use for these children, namely, replenishing their own numbers. The clergy, of course, is supposed to be celibate, so new priests, nuns, and monks had to be recruited from the general population. While these new recruits didn't have to be children, the church preferred them because they were easier to mold. Hmm, didn't the families miss their children? Certainly. But in an era where poverty was common and many already had too many mouths to feed, there was no real choice. What's more, the arrangement could actually wind up being beneficial to everyone involved. For the child, being raised by the church would mean eating better, staying cleaner, and receiving an education. For the parents, the arrangement meant saving money and resources that could be spent on the rest of the family. However, while being raised by the church meant having a full belly, a warm place to sleep, and an education, there was also, predictably, a much darker side to the practice. Many children are known to have been victimized by church leaders in a number of inappropriate ways. Accounts of those who found themselves trapped in a miserable, abusive existence within the church have survived to this very day. To most modern observers, seeing a statue weep would be greeted by immediate skepticism. One might suppose the statue had been cracked and taken on water from some outside source, or perhaps deception was involved and some devious person placed a water hose inside the statue to create an illusion. Seeing a statue weep blood might make one suspect something rusty was leaking onto it. Yet even today we hear reports of people witnessing statues they believe are crying real tears or bleeding real blood. Often they believe these tears are sent by Christ or some other heavenly figure. 
So you can imagine how easily the overwhelmingly superstitious and religious population of medieval days would have easily accepted such a sight. Indeed, weeping and bleeding statues were commonly considered powerful omens of evil or sad events to come, an interpretation that was quite useful for a church seeking to encourage continued obedience. While you'd probably think there's no way to buy oneself out of having committed terrible sins, you'd be dead wrong. In the medieval era, as much as today, the church was quite fond of money, and the faithful could actually buy forgiveness with cash. If enough money was involved, nothing was unforgivable. Even more convenient was that you could purchase a pardon in advance for something you hadn't even done yet. Plan to rob or kill someone? No problem. Just buy yourself an advance pardon and have a good time. It was a great arrangement for those who could afford it, and it made the church a fortune. Call it your get-out-of-jail card for the afterlife. One of the church's other biggest moneymakers was selling tickets out of purgatory, and you could purchase one not just for yourself, but also for your deceased loved ones. Worried that your parents or grandparents have been denied entrance to heaven and are trapped in purgatory? No problem. Purchase the pardon card. For the right price, the church would literally issue you an actual physical certificate that proved your loved one was on the way to heaven. The Pardon Card. Don't leave life without it. Some things never change. For example, adulterers in medieval times feared pretty much the same exact things modern ones do, namely getting caught. These days, a revelation like that would probably lead to couples therapy or possibly a divorce. But in the medieval era, that kind of exposure would mean being made an object of public shaming and ridicule. In fact, the term walk of shame originated in that era and was meant quite literally. Accused adulterers might be required to walk nude through the streets under the ridicule of friends and neighbors. Game of Thrones fans are probably thinking of Queen Cersei's famous Walk of Shame right about now, which was based directly on this real-life practice. Not surprisingly, despite this heavy punishment, adultery remained popular. For some, the shame is part of the game. The aforementioned Hellmouth sculptures that hung over the church doors were an effective mood setter, but they were only the beginning. Once inside the church, the parishioner would be graded by images of the end of the world, the Last Judgment, and so-called doom paintings, which depicted the faithful rejoicing with God in heaven, while the sinners boiled in a lake of fire. That's not all, though. Churches were often filled with altarpieces, statues of tortured saints, and all manner of other images of sinners being punished in hell. The church employed the greatest artists of the day to create these works, and those artists often had vivid and terrifying imaginations. For the medieval church, the need to keep a grip on their power and influence was rivaled only by the drive to make money. Church officials at all levels were primarily concerned with selling get-out-of-purgatory certificates. They also enjoyed spreading the word about how working for the church would ensure your social position on earth and reserve you a spot in heaven. This fixation on profit went so far, parishioners were often warned that any and all expendable income they came into possession of should be given directly to the church. Depending on a person's social status, contributions could come in various forms. If you were poor, you could give livestock or whatever coins you were able to spare. Upper and middle class families, and yes, there was a burgeoning middle class at this point, were also under a great deal of pressure to give. Examples of what such people might donate to stay in the church's good graces include silver candlesticks, linen altar cloths, or even a church pew. The extremely wealthy might even donate something as expensive as an ornate altarpiece or stained glass window, which might depict holy figures along with members of the donor's family. Ever hear someone refer to the seventh level of hell? You probably have, though you may not have realized that phrases like that are an allusion to the first part of Dante Alighieri's divine comedy, namely, the Inferno. This three-part epic poem, written in the 14th century, chillingly details the experience of going through hell, purgatory, and heaven. Considered one of the greatest works of Western literature, the Divine Comedy heavily inspired the artist who created the Hellmouths, as well as all the imagery within the church depicting sinners in hellish circumstances. 
Ironically, the poem was really just an excuse for its author to blow off steam at his enemies. But it was also something a lot of people could relate to, including the church. In fact, for the church, Dante's Inferno was an invaluable resource for frightening the faithful into strict obedience. Though, of course, much like the rest of their agenda, this had much more to do with keeping people in the habit of giving their money, property, and children over to the church than it did with saving anyone's soul. Medieval cathedrals were often enormous, elaborate buildings, and the fact that many still stand today is a testament to human mastery of architecture, physics, and masonry. These buildings often took several generations to fully construct, and villages and cities would rise up around them. Building a cathedral was difficult and dangerous, but also allowed for an unparalleled level of artistic creativity. For example, the original builders would often carve their own faces into the statuary and motifs on display both inside and outside the buildings. Despite this freedom, the sculptors and masons had to work within the artistic styles favored by the church. This included imagery of Jesus, Mary, and the saints, but also would typically include figures of demons and gargoyles on the building's exterior. These figures would often be depicted near doorways or high up on spires. This way, they could cast their unnerving gazes down upon the sinners entering the church, inspiring them to seek forgiveness and stay obedient. Despite all the fear-mongering the church engaged in to keep their parishioners in line, there are always those who just don't care. Whether because they didn't believe in it or simply felt an eternity of punishment was a fair price for the sins they sought to engage in, the medieval era had plenty of folks who frequently skipped church services. Some preferred to spend their time drinking, gambling, visiting prostitutes, and some just like sleeping late. Whatever the case, sins like these were punishable offenses. However, as you may have guessed, these sins were absolutely forgivable if the right financial price was paid to the church. And since a failure or refusal to pay the fine constituted a one-way ticket to hell, most people paid up. So what do you think? Does guilt play a part in your everyday obedience? We see you, sinner. The Reformation was a profound religious movement that reshaped the Christian church and European society in the 16th century. It's historically contextualized by various factors, widespread dissatisfaction with the Catholic Church's corruption, the power of the papacy, the sale of indulgences, a practice where the church claimed one could buy a reduction in punishment for sins, and the opulence of the clergy, to name a few. The invention of the printing press also played a crucial role, allowing for the rapid dissemination of ideas that challenged the Catholic Church's teachings and authority. Key figures of the Reformation include, one, Martin Luther, 1483, 1546. A German monk, priest, and theology professor, Luther is often seen as the catalyst of the Reformation. His 95 theses, which he allegedly nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church in 1517, criticized the church's sale of indulgences and prompted a debate that eventually led to significant religious upheaval. Luther's translation of the Bible into German and his numerous writings democratized Christianity, allowing lay people to interpret the scriptures for themselves. Two, John Calvin, 1509-1564. A French theologian and pastor, Calvin was a principal figure in the development of the system of Christian theology, later called Calvinism. He was based in Geneva and wrote Institutes of the Christian Religion, an influential work that systematically laid out the tenets of his faith, including the doctrine of predestination and the absolute sovereignty of God. Three, Ulrich Zwingli, 1484-1531. A contemporary of Luther, the Swiss priest Zwingli, led the Reformation in Switzerland. Independently arriving at conclusions similar to Luther's, Zwingli focused on the authority of the Bible and rejected many traditional Catholic practices. He differed from Luther on the subject of the Eucharist. Zwingli's reform spread to other parts of the Swiss Confederation, and he sought to establish a theocracy in Zurich. 
The actions and teachings of these men planted the seeds for the proliferation of new Christian denominations and brought profound political, intellectual, and cultural change across Europe. The Reformation set the stage for the modern world by challenging the central authority of the church, promoting religious diversity, and encouraging the individual's direct connection with the divine. The Anabaptist movement emerged within the broader context of the Reformation in the early 16th century as a radical wing of the reform efforts. While reformers like Luther and Zwingli sought to reform the church's doctrines and practices from within, Anabaptists desired a more radical departure from existing religious structures. The Anabaptists, rebaptizers as they were initially pejoratively labeled by their opponents, were a diverse group of Christians who shared some core beliefs, notably one, adult baptism. Anabaptists rejected infant baptism, which was the norm in both Catholic and emerging Protestant traditions. They argued that baptism should be a voluntary act of faith that signifies a believer's conscious decision to accept Jesus Christ. Therefore, only adults or those of an age to make an independent, informed commitment to faith should be baptized. Two, separation of church and state. Anabaptists were firmly committed to the separation of church and state, a revolutionary concept at the time when Christendom involved a tightly interwoven religious and political order. They believed that no government had the authority to legislate religious beliefs or practices, asserting the freedom of conscience and the autonomy of the church from secular rule. Three, religious freedom and nonviolence. The Anabaptists advocated for religious freedom, often paying for this conviction with persecution from both Protestant and Catholic authorities. Many adopted nonviolence as a principle refusing to take oaths or participate in military service based on the teachings of Jesus, which they believed advocated peace and reconciliation over violence and retribution. Four, community and social equality. The movement placed a high value on the importance of community. Anabaptists often lived in close fellowship, practicing communal decision-making and sharing of resources. They tended to favor a simple, disciplined lifestyle and were often early proponents of social equality. Due to their beliefs, Anabaptists were heavily persecuted throughout Europe by the established churches and governing authorities who saw both their theological positions and social practices as a threat to the societal order. Despite this, the Anabaptist vision has persisted and evolved over time influencing various Christian denominations, including the Mennonites, Hutterites, and the Amish, who continue to practice many of the Anabaptist principles today. Their legacy is also seen in the modern appreciation for religious freedom and the separation of church and state in many democratic societies. If you were to go to Germany and you were to go to Wittenberg, say on vacation, at one point, you would end up in the Luther House Museum. It's a treasure trove of all kinds of artifacts and legacies of the Reformation. One of the more interesting pieces would be a box that looks like this, several feet long, probably enough for one or two men to carry. This is an indulgence box. One of the things that would be carried around with the indulgence hawkers as they went throughout Germany and other parts of Europe, selling indulgences to lay Catholics. But the question I always get is, what is an indulgence? What does the Catholic Church believe about indulgences? What's going on with this practice? Is this not buying and selling salvation? Well, we can begin by talking about the Middle Ages as a whole. You see, the Church from the early days on had always believed that repentance, feeling sorry for sins, confessing them, these types of things, was part of the ongoing Christian life. There is no sense that you cease to do this ever. What had happened, though, you might say, in the Middle Ages, is that repentance had grown like a weed. No longer was repentance simply the actions that spring from the heart, true sorrow for sin, confessing to your priest, and then seeking a change in your life. Instead, repentance had grown into something that was 
theologically and pastorally, a thing that is altogether new. If you were, say, Luther, having been raised in the context of this medieval Catholic system, your life would have been very much a process of confession, penance, and restoration. You see, because the Catholic Church believed, by in particular the High Middle Ages, that at baptism, original sin is washed away. They kept what we call the Augustinian priority of grace. Grace comes to the sinner first. Now, they believe that it comes in baptism, something that many Protestants would not agree with biblically. But still, they believe grace comes first. God moves on the sinner and washes them clean. They are now covered by the work of Christ. It is then said that a Christian would enter into a state of grace. This is, I like to say, the car coming out of the car wash. The problem, though, is what do you do when you have ongoing sin, whether small or big? How do you deal with those sins? Well, in the Middle Ages, there developed a general theory that Christ had paid for the eternal debt and the eternal guilt of the sinner. They still believed, however, that there was a temporal guilt or a temporal justice that needed to be satisfied by the work of the Christian. Now, this is often very confusing for folks, but it made a great deal of sense based off of certain medieval principles, which we won't go into now. But the idea was is that Christ had paid for your sins. However, when you sin, you have temporal punishment that is due. So what the Christian would do is they would go to a priest, they would confess, they would hear the absolution, te absolvo, you are absolved, meaning you are forgiven. The priest would then assign any number of penances, praying the rosary, attending mass, going on a pilgrimage, and giving of alms, which is above and beyond your tithe. These things were part of the temporal restoration. You were in the red with God, you might say, at least in terms of a temporal punishment. So, by doing them, by making restoration, you were restored, it was said, to the state of grace. Now, the question often comes up is, well, where does purgatory come in? Well, purgatory is the final, as the name suggests, purge. If you were to die, still having restitution to be made for your sins, well, you would go to purgatory where the last purge, the last penances would be performed. Now, where does an indulgence come into all this? In general, an indulgence comes in at the point of the penance. You see, an indulgence is never something in a Catholic system where you're purchasing the right to sin or you're getting a get-out-of-jail-free card, let's say. The system is supposed to work that you still feel sorry for your sins. You're still supposed to not want them. You're still supposed to confess them, etc. But what happens is very often folks would admit that they do not have the wherewithal to do all the penance that is assigned them. Let's say you hadn't confessed in a year, or let's say you had done something particularly bad. Well, it is at this point that an indulgence comes in. You would pay money above and beyond your tithe to fund the church, which is at least theoretically doing more good than bad. So it was considered, ironically, to be mercy and grace. You give money, and you don't have to perform the penance. It was considered somewhat communal, not individualistic. So what does all this mean? Well, on the one hand, it means that the Catholic system, believe it or not, is not a works righteousness system in the same way that Pelagius was. Now, Protestant rhetoric will say that Catholicism teaches works righteousness. But you might say instead, just to be more clear, that the Catholic system is an in-by-grace, stay-in-by-works system. The belief is, is that God has secured something for you, but now he wants some return. He wants a path, a journey. He wants you to walk, and you must walk it, or else your eternal security might be in jeopardy. So the real question is one of assurance. If you get in by grace, but you have to stay in by works, there is nothing that founds you, nothing that grounds you in the gospel. And this is really what Luther experiences in the monastery. There is nothing that can give him the ultimate conviction that Christ has died for him, and that therefore the gospel is his, all of the fruits of Christ's work, both in this life and in the life to come. But of course, the other problem is that this is rife for abuse. And that is just what happens in the run-up to the Reformation. You see, because it is very hard to determine at what point people really feel sorry for sin, and at what point they're just scared of purgatory. And so in Tetzel, a man sent by the Pope and by the Archbishop of Mainz, goes up throughout Germany and comes not exactly to Wittenberg, but nearby, and he preaches indulgences. He does so with abuses, scaring folks to give up their money, 
simply for the sake of filling one of these coffers and courting it back to Rome. So, an indulgence is not buying and selling salvation, but it certainly amounts to that on some visceral, fundamental level. No matter how much people were told that Christ had paid for their sins, it nevertheless felt as if they were buying Christ himself. The Mennonites originated as a part of the broader Anabaptist movement that emerged during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Anabaptists believed in the baptism of adult believers, which was seen as a radical departure from the prevailing practice of infant baptism in the Catholic Church and other Protestant groups of the time. The term Mennonite is derived from Menno Simons a Dutch Catholic priest who became an influential Anabaptist leader. Siemens played a significant role in consolidating and organizing the scattered Anabaptist groups, and his followers came to be known as Mennonites. The beliefs and practices of Mennonites are characterized by a strong commitment to nonviolence and pacifism. They emphasize following the teachings of Jesus, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, which includes teachings on loving one's enemies and turning the other cheek. This commitment to nonviolence is rooted in their understanding of the fundamental value of human life and the desire to emulate Christ's example. Simplicity is another core principle of Mennonite faith. They strive to live simply, avoiding excessive materialism and a focus on worldly possessions. This emphasis on simplicity extends to their worship practices, often characterized by unadorned meeting houses and minimalistic worship services. Mennonites also place great importance on social justice and actively engage in various service and relief efforts around the world. They believe in addressing the needs of the poor, oppressed, and marginalized, and strive to promote peace, equality, and justice in society. Community living is a prominent aspect of Mennonite culture and practice. They value close-knit communities and often live in intentional communities or settlements where they work, worship, and support one another. Mutual aid, cooperation, and a shared commitment to service are integral to these communities. With members often supporting each other in times of need, and pursuing common goals together. Overall, Mennonites hold a distinctive set of beliefs and practices that emphasize pacifism, simplicity, social justice, community living, and mutual aid. These core principles shape their way of life and guide their interactions with others. The Amish community shares a close connection to the Anabaptist tradition, just like the Mennonites. The Amish are a subgroup that emerged in the late 17th century in Switzerland and Alsace during a time of intense persecution of Anabaptists. They were led by Jakob Ammon, whose teachings and practices led to the formation of the Amish community. Similar to other Anabaptists, the Amish emphasize adult baptism and believe in living a life of simplicity, nonviolence, and separation from the mainstream world. They place a strong emphasis on the New Testament teachings and the example of Jesus Christ. The Amish lifestyle is characterized by a dedication to traditional agricultural practices. Many Amish families are engaged in farming, often using horse-drawn equipment instead of modern machinery. This commitment to agriculture reflects their desire to live in harmony with nature and their belief in hard work as a virtue. Plain dressing is another defining feature of the Amish community. Amish individuals dress modestly, usually wearing plain and simple clothing in order to avoid excessive pride or vanity. This practice reflects their commitment to humility and separation from the materialistic culture of the mainstream society. The Amish are known for their limited use of technology. They often choose not to utilize certain modern conveniences such as electricity, televisions, and automobiles. 
This decision is rooted in their belief that excessive reliance on technology can disrupt their community's values of simplicity, community, and religious devotion. Faith, family, and community are paramount in Amish life. The Amish place great importance on their religious faith, which serves as the foundation for their beliefs, practices, and social interactions. They have a strong sense of communal identity and rely heavily on their close-knit communities for support, guidance, and mutual aid. Family bonds are highly valued and Amish families typically live in close proximity to one another, participating in regular church activities and communal gatherings. The Amish community is deeply rooted in the Anabaptist tradition, sharing beliefs in adult baptism, nonviolence, simplicity, and separation from the world. Their dedication to traditional agriculture, plain dressing, and limited use of technology reflects their commitment to a unique way of life that revolves around faith, family, and community. Often overlooked, sidelined, and underappreciated is the role that those comprising the Anabaptists contributed to the Reformation as a whole. They were part of what is known today as the Radical Reformation, distinguished from the Magisterial Reformation due to the way that they related to the secular authorities. Popular reformers such as Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, and John Calvin are considered magisterial reformers because their movements of reform were supported by the magistrates or ruling authorities. The Radical Reformation, however, believed that the church should not be supported by, connected to, or in subservience to the state. This belief on authority was not the only difference. As the name suggests, they had a different belief on the doctrine of baptism. The word Anabaptist literally means rebaptism. They rejected the doctrine of infant baptism and believed that baptism is a decision that needs to be made by individual personal conviction and surrender. And so they sought to be baptized again, a decision that brought much controversy and persecution from both Catholics and Protestants. Throughout the 16th century, the movement would spread around Europe to Holland, parts of Germany, Strasbourg, and here in Switzerland. They believed that the Reformation had not gone far enough and that some of the reformers such as Zwingli had compromised in their beliefs in order to gain favor with the state. They believed they needed to go all the way. And although they believed in justification by faith, they aimed to live a life of high moral standard, demonstrating their good works. It's hard to pinpoint a solitary founder or a singular leader from the early days, but one name that stands out is Felix Mance. He was born here in Zurich and became a follower of Zwingli, but after 1523, they believed that Zwingli's plans for reform had been compromised with the city council. A public disputation was held in 1525, and Mentz and Grobels, amongst others, tried to defend their position, and some parents refused to have their children baptized, but the council declared Zwingli the victor. This led to some making a break with Zwingli and the council, and the movement for radical reform spread rapidly. Mainz was an early leader in it and preached enthusiastically for the next two years as an evangelist. Although he was arrested several times, his life was never in danger until after the 7th of March, 1526, when the Zurich Council passed an edict making adult rebaptism punishable by drowning. He was arrested again, and on the 5th of January, 1527, Mainz became the first casualty of this edict and the first Swiss Anabaptist to be martyred at the hands of other Protestants. He was taken by boat to a spot just behind me on the River Le Mat. 
His hands were bound and pulled behind his knees, and then he was cruelly executed by drowning. Many others would suffer the same fate, and their witness and stories would inspire other Christians to stand firm for their faith. The death of these Anabaptists clearly illustrates that persecution wasn't just a Catholic to Protestant thing. Protestants were not immune from the cancer of persecution. Wherever there is a spirit of control and an inability to appreciate others' beliefs, persecution will eventually follow. Men such as Felix made a stand for their faith and died holding their convictions strong. May we also stand for the truth as these believers did in the past and may we also be gracious to others if we are in a position of leadership or authority, recognizing that God expects everyone to follow him according to their own convictions. The United States of America is filled with endless diversity. People of all colors, religions, ethnicities, and cultures come together in one giant landmass. And the center of this diversity is the Amish, a group of people who follow a traditional Christian church derived from Swiss Germany. What's up guys, we are here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is the center of the Amish. The Amish people live here, and I'm here to tell you guys a story about them, but unfortunately, I cannot show their faces up close because they don't want to be filmed, so I'm gonna respect them, I'm gonna respect their religion, I'm gonna interview other people who know about Amish, and I'm really excited to show you guys how they live and teach you about this really fascinating culture that lives inside of America. In the US, about 15% of the 300,000 Amish settlers live right here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And they are known primarily for three things. Simple living, plain dressing, and avoidance of modern technologies. They don't connect to our electricity. It doesn't mean they can't generate their own with solar or wind power or even a diesel generator for business. They don't drive automobiles. If they have a business that requires a truck or riding lawnmowers, they can certainly lease a truck, but they would have to have a non-Amish uh, to, to drive the truck. The Amish migrated to Pennsylvania in the early 18th century and are still living an identical life to centuries ago. They get around by horses. They are prohibited to use smartphones, TVs, and cars. Their language today is a dialect of German called Pennsylvania Deutsch. It's a dialect from the Swiss German that they brought with them, plus uh, about 300 years of words that got made up and some English words mixed into it. Higher education is generally discouraged as it could lead to social segregation and the unraveling of the community. And how many kids does a typical family have? Right now the average is right around eight and a half in Lancaster County. That's the information we are given this spring. Eight and a half kids, so that's a lot of money to keep them up. I'm assuming they're mostly farmers? No, they're mostly not farmers. Only about 30 percent are in farming. The rest are in trades like uh, home building, roofing contracting, barn building, um, shop owners. They have their own schools. They value a rural life, manual labor, and living under God's word. And if they fail to comply, they are shunned. Now they've got a very high percentage of the kids staying Amish in that 95 to 100 percent, it's probably above 95 percent really? staying Amish. The Amish are very private people who avoid as much contact with strangers and the outside world as possible for important religious and cultural reasons. It's really cool to see this kind of people living inside the USA because America's modernizing so quickly and we're so crazy about getting new technologies and living the most urbanized life as possible. And then you have people like the Amish who are just doing the complete opposite and enjoying life debatably more than we do. It's really special to see and experience and I hope you guys learned a thing or two from this video. The Amish community, like other religious groups, has secured constitutional protections or winning court cases that established key constitutional principles. Constitutional protections in the United States are granted by the U.S. Constitution itself and have been established and enforced through various court cases and legal interpretations by the courts. The Amish have been involved in litigation and court cases that have aided in shaping the interpretation of constitutional rights in certain contexts, particularly regarding religious freedom and the rights of parents to educate their children. The landmark Supreme Court case, Wisconsin versus Yoder, 1972, involved an Amish community in Wisconsin, challenging the state's compulsory education laws. The court ruled in favor of the Amish, 
finding that their religious freedom outweighed the state's interest in enforcing compulsory schooling beyond the eighth grade. This case further strengthened the protection of religious freedom under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Other court cases involving the Amish have focused on issues such as religious exemptions from laws requiring the use of modern technology, such as photographic identification, or participation in government programs, such as social security. These cases have helped to shape and clarify the boundaries of religious liberty within the context of Amish beliefs and practices. There have been instances where the Amish community has been involved in litigation regarding banking practices. One notable case is United States versus County Bank of Rehoboth Beach, 1997, which involved a group of Amish individuals in Delaware who challenged the bank's policy of requiring customers to provide a social security number for opening and maintaining bank accounts. The Amish, due to religious beliefs, objected to participating in the social security system. In this case, the court ruled in favor of the bank, stating that the policy was necessary for compliance with federal banking regulations and anti-money laundering laws. The court also noted that the bank had made reasonable accommodations to the Amish customers by allowing them to open accounts without providing a social security number, but with certain limitations. This case highlights the tension between certain banking practices and the Amish religious beliefs. While the Amish value simplicity and separation from the broader society, they often face challenges when interacting with financial institutions that have regulations and requirements in place, such as the need for identification and social security numbers. While the Amish have had their own legal battles and have contributed to discussions of religious freedom, it is not accurate to attribute the entirety of constitutional protections or key court cases to the Amish community alone. The idea of the separation of church and state stemmed from the notion that the government should maintain an official neutrality in matters of religion, avoiding the establishment of any national religion, and should not prefer one religion over another or religion over non-religion. This concept is rooted in the desire to ensure freedom of religion by preventing government interference with religious practices and to protect the government from religious control. In the context of the United States, the separation of church and state became a fundamental part of its constitutional framework through the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which reads in part, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This language is often interpreted to mean that the government should not support or establish any religion, nor should it prevent individuals from practicing their religion. Historically, the concept has its philosophical and political origins in a number of sources, including the works of European Enlightenment thinkers and the writings of American founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Jefferson, for example, authored the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. And in his correspondence, he famously referred to the First Amendment as creating a wall of separation between church and state. This phrase and the establishment and free exercise clauses upon which it is based became central to various legal interpretations and court decisions throughout U.S. history shaping the understanding and application of the principle of the separation of church and state. Landmark Supreme Court cases such as Everson versus Board of Education 1947 and Lemon versus Kurtzman 1971 have helped to define the application of this principle and solidify it as a cornerstone of American constitutional law. Mm -hmm. 
In the United States of America, there is a debate over the religious nature of the country, as well as the founding of the country, with many arguing that America is a Christian nation. America was not founded as a Muslim nation. So why do you think America is a Christian nation? America was not founded as a Hindu nation. The political philosophy of the founders necessitated a divine foundation. I believe our founding fathers were informed by Judeo-Christian values. Go back to what our founders and our founding documents meant. They're quite clear that um, we would uh, uh, create law based on the God of the Bible and the Ten Commandments. It's, it's pretty simple. While they understood the value of a secular government, they feared a secular society. What they thought was right and wrong came from the Ten Commandments, which is Judeo-Christian philosophy. So that is beyond a reasonable doubt. America was founded as a Christian nation. If you were to search for signs that the United States is a Christian nation, you'd find plenty. When the president-elect is inaugurated, or when Curley swears to tell the truth, old truth, and not to put the truth, they swear on a Bible. The Ten Commandments can be found in many courthouses. A verse of the Pledge of Allegiance reads, One nation under God, and the country's national motto is, In God We Trust, a phrase which can also be found on American currency. All of this is to be expected if America is a Christian nation, but what does this actually mean? mean. There are three primary versions of this argument. One is that America is legally a Christian nation. Another is that America is culturally a Christian nation. And the third version is that Christian values influenced the founding of the nation. In order to examine each of these arguments, rather than observing the country as it is now, let's examine the country as it was when it was founded. And that brings us back to 1776. July the 4th, 1776, for this was the day that 13 British colonies made a declaration of independence from Great Britain. This, during the Revolutionary War, which began in 1775 and lasted until 1783. Now, regarding the Declaration of Independence, let's begin by conducting a simple word search. How many times does the term Christian appear in this document? Jesus, Bible, religion, God the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. How about creator? All men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator. And the term providence appears near the end of the declaration as well. Each of these terms imply Christianity, they do directly reference a deity, but they do not directly reference Christianity, nor do they reference any particular religion. At this point, an argument could be made that the Founding Fathers practiced Christianity, and this is a point at which the debate often gets stuck. When arguing over how the United States of America was founded, it would seem perfectly reasonable to quote the Founders. But the Founding Fathers were independently minded individuals, many of whom were complicated characters who argued with one another and conceived their new nation in spite of their many differences. So while each one was entitled to their own opinions, those opinions are ripe for the cherry picking. They do not categorically confirm nor debunk the Christian nature of the country. Just listen to some of the testimonies of our founding fathers. Often, when the founding fathers are quoted, the argument being made is that America ought to be a Christian nation, which is not necessarily the same as arguing that America is a Christian nation, even if that is implied. If there's one thing that these quotes do accomplish, however, they support the argument that America had a Christian culture when it was founded. Indeed, a majority of American citizens, both then and ever after, have practiced some variation of Christianity. So that would support the second version of this argument. To address the first and third versions, the Declaration of Independence won't get us very far. This document, instrumental to the Revolutionary War, was not intended to govern by and after the revolution had ended, it had served its purpose. Now came the time to meet the challenge of framing a new government, and in doing so, the Founding Fathers ratified the Articles of Confederation in 1781, which didn't give enough power to the federal government and failed as a result. But hey, you can't always get it right the first time. Upon recognizing that this initial attempt was unsuccessful, the Founding Fathers gathered in Philadelphia for a constitutional convention to debate and create the United States Constitution, the supreme law of the land to this day. 
Once again, we'll begin by searching for keywords. Christianity, Christian, Jesus, Bible, God, Creator, Religion, Religious. Article 6. The senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Let's examine now the Bill of Rights for any of the terms we've already searched for. <coughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Perhaps the most notable rephrasing of this text occurred during the Jefferson administration when a group of Baptists from Danbury, Connecticut wrote to the president worried that their state government would be unfair to them as a religious minority. To reassure them, Jefferson replied by emphasizing that there was a wall of separation between church and state. With a constitution bearing phrases such as no religious test and make no law respecting an establishment of religion, the argument that the United States is legally Christian seems unreasonable. Yet, the argument that the United States is culturally Christian is reasonable. That leaves us with the third version of this argument, that Christianity, the moral and philosophical teachings of Christianity, are reflected in the Constitution. This argument concedes that the government is secular, but maintains that Christianity informed or influenced the drafting of the Constitution. If this is the basis for America being a Christian nation, let's grant it for the sake of argument and ask the following questions. What is the significance of this point of view? Does it matter if the First Amendment undermines the First Commandment? Does it matter if the Second Amendment undermines the Sermon on the Mount? How much of the Constitution was influenced by Christian principles, and is that a substantial amount? While you could say that the Founding Fathers were partly inspired by Judeo Christian values, you could also say that they were partly informed by the values of the Enlightenment. To that end, you could and should get away with claiming that America is also an enlightened nation. But that might send mixed messages given that many Enlightenment values were famously divergent from Judeo-Christian values. If it's fair to say that America is a fill-in-the-blank nation with anything that influenced the founding, then this statement isn't false, it's just not entirely true. It's relatively true. Stating that America is a Christian nation would be very similar to saying that the White House is a Greek building because of the influence of Greek architecture. Or perhaps you might describe West Side Story as a Shakespearean musical because of the inspiration drawn from Romeo and Juliet. These assessments are not incorrect, they're just incomplete. They describe some of the subject, but they don't describe the subject definitively. In light of America's founding being partly influenced by Christianity, it's possible that all of these modern tokens of American Christianity are rooted in the nation's founding. Does the Constitution require that the president-elect swear an oath to God during the inauguration? Article 2, Clause 8 of the Constitution reads, The president-elect shall take an oath or affirmation. You don't need to swear, you may affirm. And you'll also notice that the phrase, So help me God, is not included here. The Constitution does not require this phrase, nor a Bible, when taking an oath of office. The Ten Commandments are not legally permitted to be on display in courthouses, or on any government property for that matter, they can and have been removed on constitutional grounds. The Pledge of Allegiance originally did not read One Nation Under God. That was added in 1954. In God We Trust replaced the original national motto, E Pluribus Unum, in 1956, and in 1957 the phrase first appeared on paper money. Inconsequently, all of this took place during the Cold War, when the United States positioned itself against the spread of quote-unquote godless communism. So, these are the three versions of this argument. One is correct, one is incorrect, and the other is partially correct. Will you get rid of that hat? Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Huh? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Are you trying to give me the double talk? The assertion that the United States has declared itself a Christian nation is a matter of considerable debate and is not an official constitutional or legal declaration. 
Historically, the United States has been characterized by a majority Christian population and the influence of Christian morality and values on its culture and institutions. However, the U.S. Constitution explicitly avoids declaring any national religion, including Christianity. The First Amendment prohibits the establishment of a national religion, the Establishment Clause, and guarantees the free exercise of religion, the free exercise clause. These two principles form the basis of the separation of church and state in the United States. The contention some people feel arises when religious symbols, language, and traditions that have been historically prevalent in American public life are considered in light of the establishment clause. For example, the use of In God We Trust as the national motto, the addition of Under God in the Pledge of Allegiance during the Cold War era, and the opening prayers in some government meetings have been cited by some as mixing government with religious expressions. Critics argue this could be seen as a governmental endorsement of religion which should be avoided according to the principle of separation of church and state. Calling out hypocrisy typically involves pointing to discrepancies between principles and actions. In the case of the separation of church and state in America, those who perceive a hypocritical stance often argue that the government and its officials sometimes engage in activities that appear to endorse or promote religious views, especially Christian ones, thus violating the principle. Supporters of these traditions argue that they are ceremonial in nature, reflect the cultural heritage of the country, and do not constitute the establishment of a religion in the constitutional sense. They suggest that such expressions do not coerce individuals to participate in any religion against their will. The U.S. Supreme Court has weighed in on such matters variously over the years, sometimes upholding the presence of religious elements in public life as fitting within historical practices, and sometimes striking down specific governmental actions as violative of the Establishment Clause. It's important to understand that the concept of separation of church and state is continually being interpreted and reinterpreted, and what constitutes a violation of this principle may vary depending on the legal and social context of the time. The continuing public and legal debates over these issues demonstrate that the application of the principle is not static and is subject to ongoing interpretation and definition. Reformation as a noun carries a couple of significant meanings and usages along with a historical context. Word origin. The term reformation originates from the Latin word reformatio, which means a shaping again, a remolding. The components of the word are re, indicating again, and formatio, which relates to shaping or forming. This etymological root points to the idea of changing or improving something that already exists. Usages, one, religious. The most notable usage of the term reformation refers to the European religious movement in the 16th century, which sought to reform the practices of the Catholic Church and led to the establishment of Protestant churches. This is often capitalized as the Reformation. For instance, Martin Luther's 95 Theses were a pivotal moment in the Reformation. Two, general. More broadly, Reformation can mean the action or process of reforming an institution, practice or law. In this sense, it is about making changes to something in order to improve it. For example, the new government promised the reformation of outdated social welfare policies. Examples in sentences. One, religious usage. The reformation was a critical period in European history that drastically altered the religious landscape. Two, general usage. After years of corruption, the department went through a significant reformation to eliminate unethical practices. Three, in context with improvement, his demeanor underwent a significant reformation after he attended the leadership training. 
when we talk about reformation, especially in a historical context, it often relates to substantial changes and shifts, whether in religious institutions or societal laws and norms. The examples provided illustrate how the term can be contextualized differently based on the topic at hand. Separation as a noun refers to the action of moving or being moved apart or the state of being separated. This term is also used in various specific contexts such as legal, physical, and emotional domains. Word origin. The word separation comes from the Latin separatio, from separare, meaning to pull apart. Itself from C meaning apart and parare, which means prepare. Therefore, etymologically, it carries the sense of making ready or putting things apart from each other usages. One, physical separation describing a situation where objects, individuals, or groups are distanced from one another. For example, the river created a natural separation between the two communities. Two, emotional separation. It can also refer to an emotional distance or disconnection between individuals. After the argument, there was a sense of separation between the friends that took time to heal. Three, legal separation. In a legal context, separation often refers to an arrangement by which a married couple lives apart while remaining legally married. Example, they filed for legal separation while considering whether to proceed with a divorce. Four, chemical separation. In chemistry, it refers to a process by which different substances are extracted or isolated from a mixture. The separation of components in a mixture is essential for the chemical analysis. Five, political separation. It can also refer to the division of a political entity into two or more separate territories or states. The peaceful separation of the two countries was a historical event. Examples and sentences. One, physical. The vast desert provided a natural separation between the two ancient cultures. Two, emotional. Despite their separation, they maintained a strong bond for their children's sake. Three, legal. The couple agreed upon a trial separation before deciding on divorce. Four, chemical. The laboratory technician employed a centrifuge for the separation of plasma from whole blood. Five, political. The colonies sought separation from the British crown, which eventually led to their independence. The examples given help to illustrate the different contexts in which the term separation can be applied, from the physical act of moving apart to the more metaphorical or legal sense of establishing distance or difference. Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode four in my series on the family tree of Christian denominations. The 10 largest Christian communions worldwide. Basically, each church icon represents 10 million members. So, as you probably know, the Catholic Church is by far the largest Christian group in the world, with around 1.35 billion members. Second is the Eastern Orthodox Church, with 200 million. With one exception, the rest of the list is all Protestant. So, coming in at number three is the Anglican Communion, followed by the Reformed Churches, the Methodists, and the Lutheran World Federation. All of these groups have around 80 million members. We then have the Assemblies of God, which is a Pentecostal denomination that I've not yet talked about. We probably won't get to them until episode seven. Then we have the Oriental Orthodox Churches. Remember, these are different from the Eastern Orthodox churches. We talked about them in episode one, and they include the Coptic Church and the Ethiopian Church. Finally, we have the Baptist World Alliance with around 48 million members, and the Seventh day Adventists with 22 million, Anabaptists, and the Quakers. These two groups are very different from the Lutherans, Anglicans, and Reformed that we discussed last time. 
You see, when the Reformation occurred in places like Germany, England, and Switzerland, it's not as if all the Catholic churches in those places were shut down and new Lutheran, Anglican, and Reformed churches were established. No, instead, most of the Catholic churches in those places simply switched to become Lutheran, Anglican, or Reformed churches. And in many cases, the new type of Christianity was established as the state-sponsored religion. So in other words, the Lutheran, Anglican, and Reformed churches weren't actually new churches. They were simply old churches that changed their theology, and in some cases, their practices, but usually only a little bit and slowly over time. In contrast, all of the groups that we're going to discuss from this point forward were actually new groups, groups that were radically different from the Catholic Church, not only in theology, but also in practice. When it comes to the Anabaptists, one of the practices that they were most concerned with was baptism. In the Catholic Church, as well as in the Lutheran, Anglican, and Reformed churches, Christians are usually baptized as infants. The Anabaptists thought this was unbiblical because infants are not able to understand what is happening or to make a conscious commitment to follow Jesus. Instead, they felt that people should only be baptized once they were old enough to understand and believe and make the decision for themselves. The initial Anabaptists therefore baptized themselves again, which is why they ended up being called Anabaptists, meaning re-baptizers. However, the original Anabaptists simply called themselves Brethren. The movement started in Switzerland, so the term Swiss Brethren is also sometimes used for these initial Anabaptists. One of their early leaders was a man named Menno Simons. He helped spread Anabaptist ideas in the Dutch Republic, and hence the largest branch of the Anabaptists eventually became known as the Mennonites. However, in 1693, there was a schism in which some of the Mennonites left to follow a man named Jacob Amman. From that point forward, those who broke off became known as the Amish. There is a third main group as well, known as the Hutterites, named after Jacob Hutter, who helped spread Anabaptist ideas to Austria and further east. Now these days, all three of the original Anabaptist groups are mostly associated with simple living, old-fashioned clothes, and a rejection of modern technology. However, it is important to note that when it comes to the rejection of technology, there is actually a wide range of practices among Anabaptists today. Generally speaking, it's really only the Amish who reject almost all modern technology. For example, they are well known for still using the horse and buggy instead of cars. But even among the Amish, there is at least one group, the Beachy Amish, who, for example, will use the internet, albeit in a restricted way. The Hutterites are the next most traditional group, but they tend to allow more colorful clothing, and in some cases even use cell phones. And the Mennonites? Well, aside from the Old Order Mennonites, who are very much in the minority, most Mennonites no longer have any extreme restrictions on the use of technology. Conservative Mennonites still wear traditional clothing, but most Mennonites are actually indistinguishable from the average American. If you want to learn more about the Mennonites, I suggest you check out today's Ready to Harvest video, which I'll link to in the description. Ready to Harvest, hosted by Joshua, is all about the differences between Christian denominations. Now, I should point out that although the Anabaptists first emerged in Europe, many of them ended up migrating to North America. This is because initially, North America offered more freedom when it came to what religion a person could follow. However, some moved east towards Poland and then settled in Russia in the late 1700s. While there, they were influenced by the radical Pietists, whom we'll be discussing next, and therefore they took the name Mennonite Brethren. Many of them ended up immigrating to North America as well, and kept that name, which distinguishes them from the other American Mennonites, who were originally split into two main conferences, but who merged in 2002 to form the Mennonite Church USA. Now, before I get to the Pietists, I want to point out two Anabaptist groups that emerged much later than the original three. These are the Apostolic Christian Church, established in 1832 by a man named Samuel Froelich, and the Bruderhof, established in 1920 by Eberhard Arnold. In both these cases, the founders were inspired by the earlier Anabaptist groups, but rather than join them, they founded new groups. 
The Bruderhof, like most of the Amish and Hutterites, live communally, whereas the Apostolic Christian Church, like most Mennonites, do not. Okay, I now want to talk about pietism, which is based on the word pious, meaning a strong devotion to one's religion. Unlike the Anabaptists, who emerged early on in the Reformation, the radical pietists emerged more than a century later, in the late 1600s and early 1700s. By this point, Lutheranism was firmly established in many areas of Europe. But some Germans and Scandinavians felt that the Reformation hadn't gone far enough. They wanted to go beyond mere discussions about theology and focus more on a religion of the heart. Some pietists wanted to change things from within the established churches, but others were more radical and ended up establishing new groups instead. One of these more radical pietists was a man named Alexander Mack from Schwarzenau, Germany. He founded the Schwarzenau Brethren, also known as the German Baptists or Dunkers. The main denomination to come out of that movement was the Church of the Brethren. Note that although the Church of the Brethren emerged out of the Pietist movement and is often classified under the term Brethren, it was also heavily influenced by Anabaptism and therefore is usually considered to fit under that umbrella as well. Another Anabaptist church that falls under the Brethren category is the River Brethren, founded by a former Mennonite. They are more traditional, like the Old Order Mennonites, and exist in far fewer numbers. Now, I want to point out that the term brethren can be quite confusing because there are several other totally unrelated churches that also use this same term, the most notable being the Plymouth Brethren. I'll discuss them in a future episode, but for now, just note that they are unrelated to the Anabaptist Brethren. I also want to point out a few churches that developed out of pietism but are not associated with the Anabaptists and are thus not peace churches. These include the Evangelical Church of America and the Evangelical Covenant Church. Both of these denominations emerged out of the Scandinavian Free Churches. Free Churches being those that were not part of the state-sponsored churches, such as the Church of Sweden, Church of Norway, etc. Okay, let's now talk about the Quakers. They are similar to Anabaptists in that they are pacifists, but they trace their origins to England instead of to continental Europe, and never did live in communal settings. As we learned last time, the Church of England was established in 1534 as the new state church. However, like in other areas, there were some in England that felt that the Reformation hadn't gone far enough. In England, these people became known as the Puritans. Most of the Puritans wanted to change the church from within, such as Oliver Cromwell. But there were some who wanted to separate and form new denominations. These more extreme reformers became known as English separatists. Initially, there were many different types of English separatists. The Quakers were just one of them, as were the Baptists, which we'll be discussing next time. Some of the other groups were the Diggers, the Enthusiasts, the Ranters, the Seekers, and my personal favorite, the Muggletonians. All of these movements have since died out, but the Quakers and Baptists continue to this day. The main founder of Quakerism was a man named George Fox. When he was brought before the courts on charges of blasphemy, he told those gathered that they should tremble or quake at God's word, probably a reference to Isaiah 66 verse 2, which says, But this is the one to whom I will look, to the humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. This is why the followers of George Fox became known as Quakers, even though their official name is the Religious Society of Friends. One of the distinct aspects of Quakerism is their emphasis on the inner light, or the ability of every person to experience God from within. This is why traditional Quaker meetings are usually unplanned and involve a lot of silence so that each person can listen carefully to God's voice within themselves. Lucky for the Quakers and other English separatists, the origins of their movements coincided with the settling of the Americas. This allowed many of these controversial groups to avoid persecution by simply moving far, far away. Although that didn't always work either, and the Quakers ended up being persecuted in America as well. As I mentioned last time, 
Among the first English separatists who came to America in the 1600s were the Congregationalists, who fit under the Reformed branch of Christianity. They were the dominant group in New England, and thus Congregationalism became the state religion in most of the New England states, including Massachusetts and Connecticut. One early exception to this was Rhode Island, which was established by Roger Williams, who founded the first Baptist church in America there. We'll talk more about him next time, but for now, I want to focus instead on the middle colonies, just south of New England. This area was originally controlled by the Dutch. In 1657, a group of settlers living in what is today Flushing, Queens, wrote a letter to the governor asking that Quakers be allowed to worship there. In fact, they also wanted religious freedom to extend to all Christian groups, as well as to Jews and Muslims. The request was denied, but the letter, known as the Flushing Remonstrance, ended up setting the stage for what would become the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the one that separates church and state and allows for the freedom of religion. Interestingly, one of the individuals who signed the Flushing document was William Thorne, who happens to be one of my wife's direct ancestors. My wife is Jewish on her father's side and Quaker on her mother's side. Another step on the path towards religious freedom in America was the founding of Pennsylvania in 1681. It was founded by a Quaker named William Penn, who allowed people from all religious groups to come and settle in his colony. So not only did Quakers settle there, but also Anabaptist groups like the Mennonites and the Amish. However, in 1827, the Quakers experienced a major schism, with those following a man named Elias Hicks becoming known as the Hicksites. Hicks was an early abolitionist and was involved in the Underground Railroad, which helped black slaves to escape to the north. Today, the descendants of the Hicksites are those who belong to the Friends General Conference, the most liberal of the three main Quaker groups. The non-Hicksites eventually split into the Wilburites and the Gurneyites, with the Wilburites basically being slightly more conservative versions of the Hicksites, and the Gurneyites going in a totally new direction. Basically, the Gurneyites ended up becoming like other churches in America, with planned services, pastors, and more mainstream Christian beliefs. Most of the Gurneyite descendants today belong to the Friends United Meeting, although some belong to the smaller, more conservative Evangelical Friends Church. Now, before I go, I can't really bring up Quakers without addressing this. I think most people assume that Quaker Oats was a company started by Quakers. Well, this isn't actually true. The founder of the company simply named his product Quaker Oats because by then Quakers were associated with integrity and honesty, and he wanted to be associated with those traits as well. If you want to associate actual Quakers with a product, that product should be chocolate, not oats. All three of the big British chocolate companies that started in the 1800s, Cadbury's, Roundtree's, and Fry's, were all founded by Quakers. Okay, so that was a look at the Anabaptists and Quakers. The legacy of the Reformation, which began in the 16th century, led to the proliferation of various branches of Protestant Christianity, including groups that valued simplicity, pacifism, and a clear separation from state interference in religious matters. The Anabaptist movement gave rise to the Amish communities in the early 18th century. The Amish's commitment to a simple, faith-driven life and their emphasis on community and tradition are direct results of their Reformation, heretic which prioritized personal religious freedom and autonomy from centralist church authority. This newfound freedom, notably in America, continues to allow them to practice their beliefs without state interference. The Amish have maintained a distinctive lifestyle characterized by separation from mainstream society. This separation is not only a religious choice, but also a cultural one that includes traditional clothing, a ban on modern technology, and the use of horse-drawn transportation. This way of life preserves their unique identity and religious freedom, 
but also means a physical and social separation from the non-Amish world, often referred to colloquially as the English. The Reformation's focus on religious individuality and dissent laid the foundation for movements like that of the Amish, who sought freedom to practice their beliefs. This pursuit of religious and lifestyle purity has naturally evolved into a life markedly separated from the broader society in both belief and in daily practice. Take time to reflect on the information I have provided to you. Here are some questions that can prompt further thought and discussion. One, in a diverse and ever-changing world, what demographic might feel compelled to fight for the preservation of their freedom to separate church and state? Two, as societal dynamics continue to evolve, which groups might find themselves seeking protection for their religious autonomy and independence from state influence in the future? Three, Considering historical patterns, what marginalized or minority communities could emerge as the next advocates for the separation of church and state, striving to protect their own religious liberties and practices? Four, as the global religious landscape evolves, which religious or spiritual communities might find themselves in conflict with state authorities seeking to ensure their freedom from interference. Five, in an increasingly interconnected world, which demographic might perceive a need to defend the separation of church and state to safeguard their distinct cultural and religious practices against potential threats? These thought-provoking questions encourage you to reflect on the future of religious freedoms and the potential demographics that may emerge as key defenders of the separation of church and state. They prompt self-exploration and critical thinking about the ongoing relevance and importance of these principles in an ever-changing society. Israel gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahar, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your father out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. 
Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant, now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you, to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. No, but we will serve the Lord. You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord 
for yourselves to serve him. We are witnesses. Now, therefore, put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord, which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. Now it came to pass, after these things, that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being one hundred and ten years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Sira, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Geash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem, for one hundred pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died. They buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim.